Welcome to the Types of Chemical Reactions Lab video. This is to supplement what we did in the classroom, so if you missed a day, then you can find the reaction. If your observations weren't helpful, then you can watch it again and make some helpful observations to determine the chemical reactions. You will want to watch carefully as I'm going to go through all seven reactions in a matter of minutes. You're going to want to listen carefully as I'm not going to put any sort of fancy transitions. I'm going to say which reaction is which thing and you have to pick it up from there. We're going to start with reaction one and in reaction one I'm starting with a beaker of water. And before I begin I'm going to test this water with litmus paper. And we're going to do the proper chemical procedures of dipping the stirring rod in and tapping that to the test papers. And you can see the blue paper stayed blue and the red paper stayed red. And so that combination of no change lets me know I have neutral water in there, which is a very good thing considering it came out of the faucet. Now I'm going to actually do reaction one. So I have water in the beaker, and I'm going to take a small piece of sodium metal, and I'm going to place the small piece of sodium metal into the water in the beaker. So you can see that it certainly gives off a lot of energy. The sodium is spinning around the beaker. It is producing a gas and that's what's actually thrusting it around the beaker and you can kind of see the, the fumes coming off of it. Sometimes it's energetic enough that that gas will actually even catch on fire. So sometimes it spins around as a little tiny fireball. Pretty cool looking. Certainly the larger the piece the more likely it will catch on fire but you don't want to go too large as it certainly has the potential to explode. Not that exploding sodium makes all that great an explosion. TNT is obviously better, or they would use sodium instead. Uh, but it's certainly, this is a safe quantity to work with in lab, and it illustrates what we need to illustrate. So now that the reaction is obviously finished, we're going to retest the litmus paper. So I have two new strips of litmus paper. And I'm going to, again, take my stirring rod and dip and tap onto my paper and dip and tap onto my paper and now we see that the blue paper stayed blue and the red paper is turning blue so this combination of blue on both is indicating that we have a base so along with forming a gas that moved the sodium around the beaker it formed a base. So as you go through and you predict and balance that reaction, be sure your products are, one of them's a gas and one of them's got to be a base. It's a way to show on paper that what happened in real life has the real consequences that we show on paper. We're going to do for reaction two now, so we're moving to reaction two, very very similar. I still have a beaker of water but now I'm going to use potassium. And here's the thing, I'm not going to test with litmus paper because potassium's in the same chemical family as sodium. And elements in the same chemical family behave in similar manner. So in testing the potassium, I'd get the same results for the water before and after. It will change what you write on your lab analysis for the reaction, but we're still going to end up with a gas and a base, and we still started with neutral water. So here's the potassium I'm going to add in. Maybe. One of these days. There it goes. So still making a gas. This time the reaction is energetic enough. The gas caught on fire. Still moved around the beaker. And if I were to test that water now, I would see it's a base. So that is reaction two. So we've done reaction one with the sodium and water. And we've done reaction two with potassium water. Let's move on to reaction three. In reaction three, I've got some carbonic acid in this test tube with the stopper. And this carbonic acid, given enough time, will decompose. 
and it will look really boring while you wait for it to decompose. So we can speed up the rate of the decomposition in this case by adding some activation energy. That is, we're going to shake it and shaking is all that's needed to add enough activation energy to get this to happen faster. So I'm going to shake the carbonic acid. Oh, look at that. So during the decomposition, a gas must have formed that built up pressure to pop off that. So we're starting with carbonic acid and one of the products at least, so you're going to have to predict the other product, one of the products at least must have then been a gas to build up pressure and pop the stopper off. So that was reaction three and that's exactly what that should have done. Over here I have reaction four. In this test tube, the middle one, I have some hydrogen peroxide with a little bit of dish soap. And it is decomposing as well, right before your very eyes. But it will take a long, long time for you to actually see it decompose. So I'm going to speed up the reaction with a catalyst. This time, I, shaking it wouldn't be quite enough. I'm going to add a chemical catalyst to it. And now we see that, yes, in fact, it decomposes fairly quickly. We made a gas, obviously, because that gas combined with the bubbles, sorry, with the soap to make bubbles. So we're starting with hydrogen peroxide. We're making one of the products as a gas. We're going to test for that gas. Let's see if we can figure out what that gas is. So the test that I'm going to do is called the glowing splint test. Okay, This is a flaming splint. This is not a glowing splint. But I start with the flaming splint until it glows out, and there's the glowing splint. Do you see the glow? And I'm going to stick that into the bubbles. Oh, look at that. The, the wood, like, catches back on fire as it goes into the bubbles. So what must be in those bubbles that would help the glow to burn? What gas helps anything to burn? that would be the gas in the bubble. So now you have a clue as to what the gas was and you have to figure out what the other product was. There is an additional product in there. Um, but that should be something you're able to predict and balance from straight out of our reaction rules. That was reaction four. In reaction five, I'm going to take these bottles that you see in the background there, lead to nitrate and sodium iodide, and I'm going to mix them into this test tube. So here's a little lead to nitrate. Notice it's a clear solution. Here's a little sodium iodide, again a clear solution. And I'll do this one out here so you can see. No longer a clear solution. Very dramatic color change. Well, why do we have that dramatic color change? And what, what is the products? Well, you know the reactant, so honestly I would expect you to be able to predict the products even now. But we're going to take this a step further. We're going to bring it over here. And I'm going to run whatever it is in here through this filter paper that's in the funnel. So I'm going to pour it through. And I know this is oh so exciting television, but this is what we need to do. We need to sit and wait and see what is happening. So let me get you into the top of the funnel. And you can see as the clear liquid, there's a clear liquid pouring through. Okay, you can see that because in the bottom of the beaker, there's just clear liquid pouring out of the funnel. We are getting, we're getting the yellow stuff caught in the filter. So the, I point out only solids would get caught in the filter. Anything that's liquid or dissolved would go through. So this must mean that yellow we saw was actually a solid. So in mixing sodium iodide and lead to nitrate, we achieved a solid, a solid that we now are catching in the filter paper. I would expect you to be able to tell me the two products of mixing lead to nitrate and sodium iodide. And one of those two products is obviously then this yellow solid. The other product, by the way, will stay dissolved and therefore is 
pouring through the funnel. So if we waited, this would filter all the way through and we would, could get nothing but the dry, solid, and totally separate the two products this way if we wanted to. But we're going to move on. Okay, this together, the big test tube and the filtering, that was reaction five. Mixing the lead to nitrate and the sodium iodide, that's reaction five, and this is just separating the products there in the funnel. For reaction six, we're coming over here. I have hydrochloric acid, a rather strong acid, and it is in rather concentrated form here, so certainly nothing to be messed with. But I have some hydrochloric acid in that test tube, and then I'm going to add some zinc. And when I add the zinc, the reaction will occur. I'm then going to put this stopper into the test tube, and you can see there is a hose on the end of the stopper. The hose is going to direct, okay, through the hose, it's going to direct any gas that is made in this test tube into, over here, I have a tub of water, and I have another test tube. And by holding the test tube upside down under the water level like this, it's going to stay full of water until some gas comes out of the tube, in which case it would fill up this test tube. Now I point out earlier in the hydrogen peroxide decomposition, we trapped the gas in soap bubbles. This is a method we like for trapping a gas because it does not involve adding soap. I, don't, I would have a pure gas. Whatever gas is coming through the hose would be pure inside this test tube. So that's the setup. I'm going to now drop in the zinc. You can clearly see that a reaction is occurring in the first test tube. Now this is over here. This is reaction six. In that test tube, that's reaction six. That is zinc and hydrochloric acid. I am not yet to reaction seven, but you can clearly see one of the results of reaction six is a formation of a gas. I am clearly getting a gas filling my test tube in this bucket here that I'm holding upside down. So that's a big clue as to how to predict the products. One of them has to be a gas in order to be doing this. Now that this test tube is full of that gas, I'm going to test to see what gas it is. So there's my test tube from the tub full of some unknown gas, and I'm going to test it. This time I'm going to test it with a flaming splint test. So I want my wood splint on fire still. And I point out if this gas is oxygen, what would happen is the splint would burn better. If that gas is carbon dioxide, it would blow out the splint because fire needs oxygen to burn. If that gas is hydrogen, it's going to give me kind of a small, very, very, very small explosion sound and put out the splint because fire needs oxygen, not even hydrogen. So I would combust the hydrogen in there if there's hydrogen in there, but the splint itself, the burning would go out. So this would help me determine is it oxygen, is it carbon dioxide, or is it hydrogen based on the combination of does the splint stay burning or does it go out and do I hear an, a, a small explosion noise or not going on there. So I'm going to now get my splint burning. Okay. Well, easier said than done apparently. Here we go. Okay, so here's my burning splint and here's my unknown gas and I'm going to test it with the burning, well, rather annoying. Let's try this again. And I will move quicker once it's on fire. Okay, flaming splint test, here we go. Oh, we heard, we heard quite an explosion going on there. That was a good one. And it put the splint out. Notice it's no longer on fire. So that combination will tell me what kind of gas was in there. That is reaction seven. 
and I want to point this out for reaction seven. I had a particular gas in there that I burned. That means to do any sort of burning, that means oxygen from the air went inside and burned with it. I also want to point out, what do you notice inside that test tube now? Do you see those droplets of water? They weren't there before I burned it. So the combustion reaction must have also produced some product that would make these little droplets of water. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So there we are. That is reaction seven. Reaction six was the man magnesium with the hydrochloric acid in the first big test tube, the bubbling one back here. That's reaction six. And then down here, me combusting the gas in here, which was the product from that. So the product of that reaction is the reactant in this reaction with some oxygen, because I burned it. So oxygen came from the air and made some water. And that's reaction seven. So there's the seven reactions of our all reaction or types of reactions lab. And so now you can fix up anything you missed in class observation wise. You can, if you missed a day or two, you can fill in the information. Your lab analysis sheet is due, so be sure you take care of this. Good luck.